Uh, greetings and welcome on behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute and our apologies for the delay. We had some technical difficulties, um, but we're delighted that you're here. Um, my name is Michael Chevalier and I'm acting executive director of the Institute. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all joining us for this special event today. Um, it's part of our ongoing commitment to our ongoing engagement with Girard Studies at the Lumen Christi Institute. Um, we're especially honored to have on our panel, Grant Kaplan, who actually has led our summer seminar on uh, Girard uh, for graduate students in the past, and will be um, co-leading our seminar for undergraduate students uh, this summer as well. You can find out more about all of our engagement uh, with Girard and uh, our ongoing programs on the Catholic intellectual tradition at our website, www.lumenchristi.org. Um, I'm going to uh, skip over my normal comments uh, and just invite you to first um, join me in gratitude for our co-sponsors today, uh, Word on Fire and America Media. And I'd also invite you to um, support us um, especially by joining our mailing list today, a fantastic way to invite others into engagement with the Catholic intellectual tradition is through word of mouth. Um, simply share that with others. Um, and if you enjoy this program today, you can find out more how to support our programs financially at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. Um, but I am going to directly now introduce our moderator for today's event, um, Cynthia Haven, who is a national endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar and author of 2018's Evolution of Desire, A Life of René Girard, the first ever biography of the French theorist. In 2020, she published Conversations with René Girard, Prophet of Envy, and she's currently working on a René Girard anthology for the Penguin Modern Classics series. Um, her uh, Sheslav Milos, A California Life will be out in October, 2021 with Heyday Books in Berkeley. Um, Cynthia, without further ado, I invite you um, to unmute yourself, to turn on your screen, and to help lead us into this rich conversation. Cynthia? Uh, I'm here. Good, good evening. Um, the subject is René Girard conversion in the present moment. Uh, we are in the moment that René Girard predicted. He said, when the whole world is globalized, you're gonna be able to set fire to the whole thing with a single match. We see this truth every day now. As the title of this event suggests, we witness it in the present media moment. We can connect with old friends and make new ones, people we will never meet all over the world, but never face to face. We can meet on Zoom and chat with half forgotten high school friends on Facebook and it's all free. As so often the bad and the good trot alongside each other. We know the dark side all too well. On the social media, we witness escalating uh, cycles of verbal assault with victims losing jobs, reputations, or more. Crowds snowball faster and faster, gaining more power and attraction with each new participant. All of this happens with exponential speed on a medium like Twitter, which serves as a sort of modern day coliseum. People choose sides and as Gerard showed us, Eventually, the all against all conflict is pacified with a scapegoat, a victim who is selected, whether consciously or unconsciously, to blame and punish. When Shirley Jackson's The Lottery was published in 1948, <clears throat> readers found it macabre and far fetched, the chilling story of a victim who was arbitrarily chosen for death. But it turned out to be eerily, eerily prescient and insightful, describing not only our ancient past, but our future too. Every day on Twitter is a kind of lottery and everybody hopes they won't draw the short straw. The best way to become a victim, of course, is to protest the proceedings altogether. That draws, draws the mob's attention on you because your dissent calls the very process into question. The driver for all of these phenomena is human imitation. As Renee pointed out, it's how we learn. Everything from how to speak, to what jokes are funny, to how we hate and how we love. Scientists tell us that imitation begins minutes after birth. Gerard pointed out that others teach us what to desire as well. And this imitated desire leads to conflict when we inevitably want the same thing, whether it's a grand amour, 
or the mini, mini, mini dopamine rush of a Facebook like. Through imitation, we create contagions of conformity and competition and the media, social or otherwise is the amplifier. All desire is desire for being, Sherard wrote. We want in the first place because we crave the very being of someone else. We want to have their metaphysical goods <clears throat> or what we imagine their metaphysical goods to be. We hope that by getting what others have, their iPhone 12, the chance to be an Instagram influencer, their Aegean cruise among the Greek islands on Facebook, we we've, we've, will become them or become like them. But it's a phantom that recedes as you pursue it. And whether it's on Instagram or TikTok, we think we use the social media, but as we know, it uses us. It spies on us, it collects information on us to sell to advertisers, it trivializes us. It is a shorthand for a self-presentation. And the ultimate product it sells is our attention. We post photos of the places we go and the food we eat to compete, which is to say, to inspire envy in others. The social media herds us and hurries us. It generally reduces meaning rather than enhances it. I've stressed some of the negatives, but uh, now I have a confession to make. I use the social media every single day, lots, probably more than most of you. I rely on Facebook and Twitter to promote my books and my articles. I run a high traffic literary blog, Bookhaven, on the Stanford website. And I have started a YouTube channel for the Stanford Book Club that I manage. And I'm not alone. Father Steve Grinnell, one of our pod panelists, also uses it every day with stunning success. And I hope he'll tell us how today. Given the manifest pitfalls of imitation, what does it mean to evangelize on behalf of the man who essentially said, imitate me? That is one of the questions I hope we will explore tonight. Eastern religions exhort us to eliminate desire, but Christianity has a different take. The answer isn't to banish our wanting, but to want more, to want better. We waste our time in trivial pursuits while heaven hovers around us, and we are offered possibilities far better than anything we can imagine, far beyond our deserving. We want to be like the models of our desire. So how can we use our desire to become more Christ-like? That kind of desire, the kind that Christian love proposes, is not a zero-sum game. It's not something we can get at the expense of someone else. And so it can form the basis of a real camaraderie and a real love. And I hope it's something that we can begin in this cyberspace room tonight. So let me introduce the people that I hope will help us do that. Professor Grant Kaplan is Steber Chair of Theology at St. Louis University. He is the author of René Girard, Unlikely Apologist, Mimetic Theory and Fundamental Thought Theology. Carly Osborne is uh, at the Australia's University of Divinity and is the author of tragic novels, René Girard and the American Dream, Sacrifice in Suburbia. She's also the author of the popular guide, The Theory of René Girard, a very simple introduction. And Father Stephen, uh, Stephen Gruno is CEO and executive producer for Bishop Robert Barron's Word on Fire Apostolate. He's a priest of the Archdiocese of Chicago. Welcome all. Let's start with you. Um, Steve, would you like to unmute yourself? We can start with you. We should be Let's unmuted. Steve, Grant. Let's start with Grant. Okay. I, um, can you unmute yourself, Grant? I am unmuted and I'm ready. <clears throat> um, Yay. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Your um, introduction was so beautiful. I almost just, I, I wish I could kind of forfeit my time and have you explain things so <laughs> simply, but so essentially, uh, so uh, with such depth. Um, so I'll, I'll do my part to imitate. Um, <laughs> there he was, caught in the act. This time, nobody could deny it. The screenshot of the post from four years ago gave all the evidence we needed. 
Not only was he exposed in broad daylight as a racist, but as a particularly stupid one, who having such thoughts would be insipid enough to make them public. And despite rising to prominence based on media savvy, he displayed wanton hubris in thinking he could delete the old posts, his lame attempt at scrubbing, at literally whitewashing his ugly bigotry. He was in for it now. I scanned the ground, looking for something medium-sized, too big at risk failure to land, too small it wouldn't cause much of a blow. I had been at enough of these things to know how they go. Someone, usually reeking of booze, throws the first one and it often misses. It's almost comic. Then a few more stones hit the mark and it's harder to tell who threw them. The perfect time to strike is right about then when he's still standing up, but a well-directed stone can fell him. I mean, it's pathetic to wait until he's already on the ground. This time, however, they, they did wait uh, for there had been someone raising a ruckus about forgiveness and reconciliation. So before the doxing started, before the cancellation began, <clears throat> we wanted to see what he would say. The leaders of the purification asked, teacher, this man was caught in the very act of committing an abominable crime. The law says we can cancel this person. What saith you? No doubt at this point, <clears throat> I have lost some of you in my attempt to remix a story we're all familiar with from the present moment with a story from the past. Detractors may think I have inevitably gotten the story wrong by confusing the actors and the scale of the crimes. I have replaced a true victim or compared a true victim with a false one. <clears throat> I've tried to make a biblical peri pericope contemporary without even studying the Greek or the commentary tradition. <clears throat> Allow me, however, to linger with this pericope from John 8, which was the inspiration for my current, uh, my reflection, my example. It is one of the few biblical stories that in our biblically illiterate age, we have all nearly memorized. And most likely, if you're a churchgoer, you can almost hear the homily or sermon before it's spoken, spoken, hitting on the familiar themes. Where was the man in this situation of the woman caught in adultery? What was Jesus writing on the ground? <clears throat> what does it mean to be without sin? And let's not forget, Jesus tells her to sin no more after the crowd disperses. In my remaining minutes, I'd like to return to the present moment. <clears throat> what is it? Is it a moment when cancellation has gone too far or not far enough? <clears throat> and to return not just to the present moment, but to perhaps our prophet of the present moment, Rene Girard. What kind of interpretive lens makes it possible to find congruence between these two events, <clears throat> a biblical near stoning and a modern day uh, cyber cancellation? For now, it's enough to say that something is amiss <clears throat> and that Rene Girard, <clears throat> whom Bishop Robert Barron once claimed in centuries to come, he may remem be remembered as one of the great fathers of the church, that Rene Girard does have something to say. The journalist Thomas Chatterton Williams, neither a theologian nor a Girardian yet, nor a Catholic, also reached a similar conclusion in an essay from last summer in Harper's Magazine. <clears throat> Williams, like, like me and like um, Cynthia Haven, begins the essay with a scene of stoning, this one literary from the aforementioned story by Shirley Jackson. William summarizes, in subtle, ruthlessly efficient prose, Jackson portrays this tendency, surely as old as humankind itself, to find scapegoats, ostracizing, penalizing, punishing, and humiliating individuals in the process. <clears throat> Last summer, the New Yorker reprinted this story, and it's not hard to discern why. Surveying the contemporary scene, Williams recalls a tweet from 2019, 
Each day on Twitter, there is one main character. The goal is never to be it. <clears throat> if the present moment is hard to be captured, the present age is perhaps less inscrutable. It is undeniably a secular age marked by being post something, be it modernity, industry, structuralism, Christianity, or even secularity. Whether the secular post-Christian era is good or bad or neutral, or what it means for the future must be left to the side. The more enduring question is the relationship of this era to Christianity. Gerard describes this relationship in many places, but perhaps nowhere so memorably as in the chapter titled The Modern Concern for Victims in his book, I See Satan Fall Like Lightning. Gerard states, our society is the most preoccupied with victims of any that ever was. This seems like a good thing after all, a society preoccupied with victims is less likely to participate in something like a stoning. Despite many humanistic attempts to conceal the Christian trace, Gerard concludes that the origin of our modern concern for victims is quite obviously Christian. Yet a concern for victims is not enough to make us Christian. It is like so many good ideas or deeply held ethical stances, it can go sideways. Gerard explains, the concern for victims has become a paradoxical competition of mimetic rivalries, of opponents continually trying to outbid one another. And in case it isn't clear enough, the next sentence reads, the victims most interesting to us are always those who allow us to condemn our neighbors. Gerard continues in the next chapter by critiquing the attempt to sever the post-secular or post-Christian age from the previous one. He says, the majestic inauguration of the post-Christian era is a joke. We are living through a caricatural ultra-Christianity that tries to escape from the Judeo-Christian orbit by radicalizing the concern for victims in an anti-Christian manner. Like so many passages in Gerard, the one just cited raises many questions as it answers. How can the era be both post and ultra-Christian? What does it mean to radicalize concerns for Christians? How would this analysis map on, say, to something like the sex abuse scandal? At this point, let me turn to a 2018 essay by Abigail Favail in the Church Life Journal. She describes a classroom dis discussion in which victimhood or proximity to victimhood become the sole port of entry into a discussion of Ovid's metamorphosis. Faval goes on to distill the work of two sociologists, Bradley Campbell and Jason Manning, on victimhood culture as a moral culture. Earlier moral paradigms include honor culture, think duels and honor killings, and dignity culture, think turn the other cheek and a dignity culture responds to deep injustice by appeal to a higher authority from which one receives a common dignity. Victim good culture combines aspects of the two other paradigms. Like honor culture, victim good culture create, uh, features a sensitivity to slights and offenses. Like dignity culture, it seeks the intervention of a third party authority to handle conflicts. The veil describes his victim of culture as a fun house mirror version of puritanical Christianity, uh, Christian morality, but without the concept of grace. What is missing, in other words, from victimhood culture is conversion. Gerard describes, himself describes this idea of conversion just after the passage I cited above. He writes, we do not all have the same experiences as Peter and Paul, who discovered that they themselves were guilty of persecution and confessed their own guilt rather than that of their neighbors. <clears throat> End quote. The grace to pray for in the present moment is perhaps first to grapple with the ways in which we are guilty of persecution, if not with stones or with anonymous Twitter account, then in some other way. And to begin, once the stones have been put aside, <clears throat> we should imagine ways in which to build a new type of community built upon forgiveness that includes rituals of reconciliation. These rites can replace the rituals of ostracization through which ever since the fall, we have settled for false ways of belonging. There is to be sure work to do 
but it is subsequent to the work that Christ does in us. Thank you, Grant. That was wonderful. Uh, we turn now to Carly Osborne. Would you like to unmute yourself? Hi, Cynthia. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everyone, for having me join you. My particular interest in the topics of today's panel are the um, ideas around social media and violence. I've written a little about this in the past, and uh, those of you who have read my little book, which is a very simple introduction to Girardian theory, will know that I poke fun a little bit at the ways that human beings use Christianity as just another form of creating tribal in-groups and turning violence onto excluded out-groups. So what I'd like to begin with today is just a little bit of a reflection on what it's like when in the Bible Jesus comes to show us who God is and the ways in which we, through Girardian theory, can see human logic working against this kind of divine logic. The human logic being a logic of violence, a logic whereby social problems are solved by making victims and excluding outsiders, and a divine logic which does something quite different. In Mark 13, Jesus speaks to his listeners about what it is like when God comes. And he's very clear that wars and earthquakes, human violence, natural disasters are not what it looks like when God comes. And attributing these things to God is broken human logic. And when a person suffers, it isn't because they have sinned or done something wrong. God, the father of Jesus, the one that he embodies, represents, and is incarnate, is not the doler out of condemnation and punishment. In fact, when Jesus has a chance to retaliate against those who persecute him, who genuinely deserve punishment, who in human logic, it would be justice to direct violence towards them, he does not lift a finger. When Jesus comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, many of the Jews singing on the streets thought that this was the triumph of a warrior God who would lead an army to wipe out the Roman oppressors. And many readers of the Bible since have thought that it was the triumph of a kind of brilliant sleight of hand in which God is a punishing God who demands someone to punish and sort of splits himself in two so that he can take the punishment on himself and therefore beat himself at his own game. But is that what Jesus is like? Does he demand restitution before he forgives? Does he let his disciples raise their swords to defend his unimpeachable honour? No. God isn't standing up for his rights here. His right to be appeased, to be apologised to, to be paid in blood for the crimes committed against him. He is doing the absolute opposite. We are the punishers. Our human anger and pride, institutional greed and power, that's the terrifying deity being worshipped by the mob here, and that's who Jesus is being sacrificed to. He is being violently punished by humanity for who he is, not by some still-in-heaven version of himself. There is a mythical image of a terrifying godlike power utterly crushing and ripping apart a human being. But that terrifying mythical monster is not God, it's humanity doing what Gerard, many of you will know, called the scapegoat mechanism. The God who we met in the incarnate Christ, who could have condemned us did the opposite. He let us condemn and kill him. He let all our horrible sacrificial logic about punishment and death be carried out upon himself. And not for a moment did he blame us or shame us or retaliate against us. So what follows? We have a way out 
of the broken logic of power relationships held up by violence and punishment. And these power relationships are as relevant today in the world of modern politics and modern social media as they were uh, in the time that Christ was coming into Jerusalem. Paul in Philippians tells us that Christ did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He wasn't grasping for power or exercising his power. Humans love to exercise power over other people, political power, colonial power, gendered power. If we look at some of the scandals and the awful things that are in the media about the way that people behave towards one another, so much of the time this is about grasping for power, exercising power, perpetuating power against the powerless. And we are given a revelation about God's undoing of that kind of power struggle. Isaiah says, he who vindicates me is near, who will accuse me? The Lord God helped me, who will declare me guilty? In other words, God has forgiven us and he isn't interested in accusing us because that kind of accusation is the first half of an equation that leads to the circle stoning the woman caught in adultery. Christ showed us very clearly, horrifically even, how he feels about our human violence. Lay it all on me, he said, do your worst. And rather than exercising my right to turn the tables and punish you, I will take it all, I will receive it all in one direction from you to me. No violence back from me to you. And I will take this as a physical beating of a human body and then raise that body back to life and let you see my resurrected body, which you could not destroy, to show you that I am God, I am love. This love has overcome all the hate and evil and brokenness that humanity could ever perpetuate upon one another. And that is the triumph of his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That is what he triumphed over, our violence, our hatred. And so we live in a world where the love of God is an active present force. We commit as individuals to a lifetime of transformation as we imitate Christ and the way of the cross. And we work and pray towards a world where humanity moves from oppression and violence to self-sacrificial love towards one another. How we see this playing out in fields like social media, which is by its nature mimetic, is most fascinating to me because the way that social media is constructed, it is a perfect medium for imitation and for forming of tribes and forming of echo chambers and for doing these scapegoat mechanism things where victims are chosen and brutalised. But the wonderful Catholic thinker, James Allison, a great hero of mine, reminds us that mimesis can also be positive and a tool which is highly mimetic like social media can be used to create communities where what is being imitated is self-sacrificial love. And that's where I see hope for the future of social media, that whilst as a tool it can bring out the worst in humanity, it can also be a forum where we come together to live out the imitation of Christ, which is mimetic, and imitate one another in that practice and therefore move away from the logic of violent victimization to the logic of the kind of justice which is based on grace. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. Uh, may we turn next? We're running a few minutes behind already. Does Father Steve, would you like to join us now? Certainly, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very deeply honored to be part of this panel. And I must admit that I'm feeling a little bit out of my element. I'm kind of have that sense of being the odd man out because I'm not a scholar, I'm not an academic, 
I've no, published no great books or articles about Rene Girard. However, not only his work, but also his witness has been personally important to me as a Christian and as a Catholic priest. And Girard's insights can continue to influence how I exercise governance over Bishop Barron's apostolate and discern how Word on Fire should best engage with the culture. You know, I met Rene Girard while I was in the seminary many, many years ago, and I was even invited to share a lunch with him. And that encounter had a profound impact on me. And the conversation that we shared that day is rarely ever far from my mind. I would like to offer three insights regarding the intersection of Rene Girard's work and my own work in evangelization. And I'm placing these insights in three categories, the past possibilities, the present predicaments, and the future possibilities. My own work in evangelization includes both what I would term field work, which is characterized by direct personal encounter, and evangelization through media, particularly digital media. I'm going to focus here on my evangelization through digital media. When I began this evangelization work in digital media now over 15 years ago, my attitude was one of enthusiasm and great promise. Digital media provided new communication possibilities which were as revolutionary for sharing the gospel as the technology that had built the Roman roads upon which St. Paul traveled or those printing presses that in the 15th century enabled the church to greatly amplify her efforts to share both witness and teaching. Both these technological innovations enabled the church to move out of a perennial temptation to narrow itself, to insulate itself, to become preoccupied with ad intra concerns, and instead open itself up to the world, which Christ has determined himself to be the focus of the church's concerns. You know, the church can gain some traction and strength from narrowness from only so long before that strength dissipates and the church becomes sclerotic. When the church goes out from itself and it finds renewed vigor for its mission, because the church is missionary by its nature, and it flourishes and grows in proportion to our willingness to do what Christ wants his church to do. And what does Christ want his church to do? To evangelize, to share the good news of the gospel. A church that falters in evangelization risks not only its relevance, but its very life. And so these innovations in technology, be they roads or printing presses or digital media, can facilitate the church's mission in extraordinary ways. We need to go out, out into that great digital sea. Now, early on, when my sense of the digital environment was one of promise and possibilities, I found the work of Rene Girard to be not only helpful, but necessary. At that time, the principal interlockers for an evangelist were the atheist, the skeptic, and the seeker. In all these groups, Gerard provided a way of speaking about the gospel that was to the listener fresh and interesting. His work challenged the presupposition that the gospel could be dismissed as a mere myth or that it could just easily fit into a relative, relativistic account of religion. Further, Girard's sense of revelation and of God challenged accounts of God in the popular culture that made him out to be a moral monster or construed revelation as being merely subjective, an opinion. Girard demonstrated to the interlocutor that the gospel is unique and provides something of value that even if you don't take it as revelation, you understand it deserves consideration and respect. Now, that was the period of my first naivete in terms of digital evangelization, and I am well beyond that first naivete now. After over 15 years of evangelization efforts in the digital space, I've moved from possibilities and promise to predicaments. You see, the digital space manifests itself as a cauldron of mimesis that instigates and amplifies mimetic rivalry. And this is particularly evident on social media in which the mimetic culture is necessary for it to function. 
However, that mimetic culture manifests, manifests itself almost daily in satanic expressions of, of mimetic rivalry, monstrous doubling, mob action, and scapegoating. And if this isn't happening daily, it's always threatening to boil over at the slightest instigation. And what makes this worse is that grifters have figured out how to monetize all this conflict for personal gain. And that has led this boiling cauldron of mimesis to become not just a boiling cauldron, but a pot of gold. Increasing our troubles is the fact that this conflictual status quo seems built into the algorithms of digital media itself. And the artificial intelligence is thinking all this through for us and at a pace faster than the human intellect. It's shaping and forming our ways of thinking and acting in social media, but not just there, but also in the real world. What we do in social media now has implications in reality. Gone are the days when you could say, well, the internet is not the real world. It is the real world. It's the world in which we live. So we now have a mimetic crisis as a continual status quo that's amplified to a global scale, and we're constantly searching for scapegoating sacrifices to bring order to the chaos. Welcome to a new secular religion and its social media temple. But here's the thing. We have the resources in Rene Girard to interject some sanity and even holiness into this environment. And I believe a robust presentation of his mimetic theory can help. It is perhaps for me the most important resource that can be used in the face of our current predicament. And, in this, and, and it is in this regard, a redoubling of efforts to promote Rene Girard, not just in the academy or even in the churches, but in the popular culture and in particular in the digital environment. That's the great evangelical move that needs to be made. Further, conversation needs to be facilitated right now, as soon as possible, between those who are the bearers of Girard's thought, his legacy in the present, with the future creators of artificial intelligence. The gravity of this responsibility is pressing upon all of us who know Rene Girard's thought with incredible urgency. It's mimesis that has made social media what it is, and without much understanding of the cultural dynamics that happen as a result of mimetic rivalry and scapegoating. As you can see, unless a robust conversation with the makers of art artificial intelligence begins, with the thought of Rene Girard, there's much at stake. Now, I believe that both the culture and the church are in the midst of a mimetic crisis of massive proportions. And that crisis is expressed and amplified by technology. The crisis is not, as many say, one of radicalized polarization. What we are facing is mimetic conflict and rivalry. And what we have in Rene Girard is a prophet for this moment. He's a real truth teller who can not only make sense of what seems to be utterly irrational, but also can help us to discern a way forward in which there can be a de-escalation of violence, but also a revelation, a singular offer of grace. We can pass through this moment to a new moment of gospel-based Christian revelation. How will that happen? Through interjecting not only the thought of Rene Girard in terms of mimesis with greater robust quality into the social media space, but also to exemplify ourselves, the positive mimesis that is necessary to move the needle. This is how we might move from the present predicaments to the future possibilities. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Father Steve. Um, 
We're going to be going to the audience for audience questions shortly, but I, we're going to have some questions among the panelists. So um, if you have any questions, please note at the bottom of your screen the Q&A sections and ask them there, and we're keeping track. Um, can we go back to Grant? Grant, are you there? I am here. Grant. I am here, yes. Oh, you're there. OK. I am here, yes. All right. I wanted to ask you. I ran across some words that you you wrote. Um, you know that Karl Rahner uh, said the Christian of the future will be either a mystic or he will not exist at all, which you amended to the Christians of the future will be Girardian or he will not exist at all. Uh, that's a big statement. Could you explain? Yeah, it's a wild uh, uh, act of hyperbole. Um, <clears throat> what I don't mean is that people will need to replace the gospel with uh, sort of the, you know, four, four versions of, uh, of Gerard and your biography in the front, although they should all read it. What I mean is simply <laughs> Thank that, you. yeah, I mean, we need to see ourselves as sinners in need of redemption and um, not to be caught up in a sort of myth of our own goodness. Um, the problem with the myth of goodness isn't that we're we're really terrible people or something like this, but that it, um, if we believe too much in the myth of our own goodness, then when we, when we fall short, short, when we err, we're gonna try to cover it up. Um, like the myths cover things up. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we will need to sort of <clears throat> believe in it in that way and to understand that we're all capable of scapegoating others. So the point of Gerard is not to then understand all the ways in which we're scapegoated, but to see, discern within ourselves the, uh, you know, the, the, the darkness that sometimes uh, animates even the best of people and the saints according to their own admission. Um, so that's the sense in which I think uh, we need to become Girardians of a certain kind. Cynthia, can you still hear us okay? I can, I, I just got back, Don. I, I lost you for a moment, but I'm here. Okay, great. Are you, are you finished? Did I, I miss the end? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. I will catch it on the, on the recording. Carly, um, you spoke a little bit about the question I already wanted to ask you. So I'm gonna ask you another one um, in, a, in a more lighthearted vein. You've written how Facebook leads to murder. Tell us how that works from a memetic point of view. <laughs> sure thing. So um, the backstory to this for our audience is that uh, many years ago, I think it was in about 2010, I, I gave a public lecture on this title, uh, How Facebook Leads to Murder, about Girardian theory. And the title was a little tongue in cheek but I received some criticism for it because people really, they just thought Facebook was wonderful. And they said, you know, you just, you sound like a Luddite when you say, oh, you know, oh, look out, Facebook is, is, is going to take us down a dark path. And I said, well, you know, I've just been reading Girard and um, I'm looking at sort of my mesis and, and imitation and crowd behaviors and, you know, I'm a little worried. But I really couldn't find anybody who, who would believe me at that time. And of course, in the decades since, we have seen quite literally that Facebook and social media can lead to murder, that um, the kind of echo chambers that social media creates often break out of the virtual space into real world acts of violence, of particularly collective activity. And, you know, Gerard talks quite a lot about the way that mimesis works upon emotions and the sense of being in the tribe that is so deeply satisfying on one level to human beings and you can from that place of reflected back and forth continually escalating mimetic emotion ordinary people take to the streets and and do things that we would not perhaps have predicted uh, a decade or more ago. And 
So what we see is that social media has a particular power to amplify this back and forth of continually one-upping, escalating violence, um, which, you know, I mean, Gerard talks about that on a large scale as well in books like Battling to the End. But even just between individuals, there's uh, this sense that mimesis and the roads it takes us down are just, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the broad and smooth way oh, with yeah, social right. media. I'd be very interested to hear what my other panellists have to add to that, actually. May I, may I offer a, a, a question, really, to, to Carly? I, I find that what you just said is just fascinating because it's describing the social media environment so well. But earlier in your presentation, you talked about that Christianity itself has, or at least Christianity and its presence in social media, has basically been co-opted in terms of the tribalism, the, the mob, the, the scapegoating mechanisms. And I see that uh, happening. I've, I've seen its development, actually. It's, it's kind of evolution in the social media space. And, and I'm wondering if you could say more about that. I, it would be helpful to me, and I think it would be helpful to the people who are, who are watching this. Sure. Um, if I may, I'm just going to step behind myself to, to get a visual aid. Very good. I hadn't intended on doing this, but I've got this on my shelf. And so um, I'll, I'll just bring it up because uh, this is my little book. Um, I don't mean to be self-promoting. I'm not going to say much about it, but this is a little cartoon that I wrote, which I feel encapsulates uh, where Christianity falls back into the logic of my basis and violence. And uh, I'll try to get it about there. The, the first little guy is saying, wow, the scapegoat is innocent. Now I get it, having just observed the crucifixion. And the second guy says, and if anyone doesn't get it, we'll kill them. <laughs> yeah. And his friend says, I don't think you get it. Yeah. So the idea is that Christianity is such a radical undoing of the logic of tribalism and exclusion and scapegoating and violence that it requires us to let go of those mechanisms completely and instead welcome everybody as a child of God. But from the very earliest church right through to today, Christian communities have often simply continued the, the logic, the, the worldview, which says we've got the revelation and you guys don't, so you are the enemy and it is our job to defeat you rather than it is our job to embrace you. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I hope that answers your question. That, that, that's beautifully put. And it, it, so the, the, re, the revelation is, is no longer a gift that is presented in, in probably, you know, my terms as the evangelist to the world. So we have this gift, we want you to share it. And instead, the revelation becomes weaponized. Absolutely. Um, it, it just becomes weaponized. And, and, and the tribalization of Christianity misconstrues the revelation as <laughs> deliverance from violence and instead instantiates violence as essential to its propagation. Um, yes, very well said. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, any, uh, anyone who's taken a quick glance at the last 2000 years of history will be able to see that. Mm -hmm. very, yeah, very what's, what's interesting, Carly, is how visible it is to this day. And in particular in, in its kind of memed, you know, uh, uh, form in social media, you know, in a, in 150 kind of characters on, on, on Twitter, you can continue to instantiate the weaponization of Christianity rather than its presentation to the world as an evangelical gift. 
I, that's the way that I look at, you know, uh, Girard's kind of presentation of Revelation, that it's this divine gift has now been given that can liberate us from structures of kind of willfulness, domination, and violence. But will we accept the gift for what it is? And what we, once we have it, what are we going to do with it? <laughs> and and the, the evangelist task is give it away, give it away. And in that respect, the gift grows and grows. And in Girardian's terms, a positive mimesis then takes over and the culture can be transformed. But if the gospel gets distorted and weaponized, that, that process is stopped in its tracks. Um, and, and my concern is, as I look at the social media space right now, is that's what I'm seeing. And I'm seeing a lot of it uh, and not the contrary. Um, that, that there's a tribalization of, of Christians that has happened via social media that is, is troubling to me. Mm, I agree. And uh, particularly, I think, in your context in the U.S., but I, Cynthia's coming in again here. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to ask you a question, uh, Father Steve, before we go to the um, uh, audience questions. How do you manage the negative effects of social media? How do you do that personally in your own work? Um, May that be a short question? I realize you know the, the thing is there's the practical management of it, and and I, and that's you know the management of our various uh, sites, uh, social media sites, and things like that. That um, you, you there's certain things you try to do to mitigate the the negative mimesis the, and the scapegoating and the verbal violence. Uh, and a lot of that is 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 wearying because it it's managing feeds and stuff like that. But I, I want to take it beyond that level to and and use your question as as more of a spiritual question of of how you kind of deal with it. And <laughs> I think it's satanic. I, I think it's the best. I'm going to use spiritual language because it's the only language I have. It's as if we fall under the thrall of demons, and. You, you, what you're seeing is kind of the chattering of demons in the social media space. And how do you deal with a demon? I mean, the, the gospel says you have to drive it out. But, you know, in, in our spiritual tradition is you can't accept that it's lies as being statements of truth. You can't listen to it as if you're going to gather something from it of value. It has to be kind of muted in social media terms and then ignored. And there then has to be an interjection of the gospel truth into that space as a kind of, for lack of a better word, an exorcism of it. Um, I always often advise you know, uh, my staff, I say in terms of certain social media interactions, they shouldn't be going there because the, the actor that they're dealing with in that conversation is not just the person, it's a spiritual power. And you know, if I if I had a more sophisticated vocabulary to express it in Girardian terms, I, I would try to do it. But to me, it's 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 say it's the Satan, it's the accuser that's operative there, and you have to deal with that situation for what it is. Um, yeah. Cynthia, I don't know if that really answers. It's it's my grasping at a way to answer your question that gets beyond the practical management of social media sites to the spiritual reality that's under underpinning your question itself. So I hope I did a good job, but I don't think I did. <laughs> I think you did a great job. Thank you, Father Steve. So we're going to turn to audience questions. Um, we have one from Christopher Mueller. Um, I guess this is a more, more of a question for the scholars. Uh, this is Christopher uh, Mueller, uh, currently a PhD candidate, writing a philosophical dissertation around the works of Girard, particularly his notion around the meaning of history. In Achevé Clausewitz, battling to the end, Girard states that he, quote, is now convinced that mimetic history needs to be written. It would help us understand what, it is, what is at stake in our own time. So who'd like to tackle that one? I'll answer it badly. I mean, I often think that what we need for like a history of religious orders in the church is a mimetic history. And so what, 
you know, you talk to Dominicans and Jesuits and they act like they're so different. Anyone who's outside of this realm is like, you guys are exactly the same. And so, I mean, I think, yeah, and you could write a great history of the disputes between Jesuits and Dominicans, for instance, um, just ba based on, you know, that, that insight that similarity and not difference is often the cause of escalation and that our world history could be written that way. I mean, we're at the end of history, you know, 30 years ago. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't look like it's ending. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, you know, uh, a lot of the notion of someone like, um, uh, I, I'm blanking on his name, but the, the, this idea that our differences are so great that they can't possibly be bridged. And this is gonna be the cause of all future violence and wars. Well, it's the similarities that I think Gerard would, would also uh, was getting at there. Mm. Mm. This uh, idea of monstrous doubles from Gerard's work that as the protagonist and the antagonist escalate back and forth towards one another, they gradually become unrecognizable. Um, I think we've played with that a little actually in contemporary film. Um, and, and the ways that uh, modern superhero movies are starting to move towards flawed superheroes and uh, sympathetic villains that you end up saying, oh, you know, we're not so different, you and I, is, is sort of a big theme that we see in, in these modern films. But there are also historians who are working on the way that emotion itself has a mimetic element and that that drives major historical change. Uh, if any of our audience would like to look up the work of a major Australian research centre uh, with which I was involved for many years, the Centre for the History of Emotions, there is quite a lot of work coming out of this field. It's not theological study, it's they are historians, but looking at the way that uh, humans, I guess, play off each other and become similar to each other and escalate in ways which are very familiar to those of us who know Girardian theory. Um, and that as we come to understand this better, it may shine a great deal of light on our present historical and political moment. Um, shall I move to another question from an anonymous attendee? Um, no, I mean, we're going to read one from Laura Giles. We are certainly seeing tribal mimetic behavior online and it's affecting very ex Catholic com communities by breaking them down into pronounced liberal and conservative camps. I think we need high profile discussions online to show that Catholics of different political temperamental inclinations have more in common in Christ and in his church than anything that divides us. Any hope for that? <laughs> Uh, Cynthia, maybe I can say something about that. And it's, it's, it's kind of uh, referencing what Carly and Grant are talking about that, you know, there's been, a, for many, many years, there's been, uh, there's been a polarization in the church that's been characterized as left and right. And there's been an emphasis on there, there are these differences between them. And, but I've just kind of noticed in the past few years, particularly as the social media space has kind of taken hold of this positioning, that the left and the right in the church are becoming increasingly similar to one another and their <laughs> objects of attainment and their goals for it, attainment. And, and to me, it's like, I no longer speak of polarization in the church. I don't like using those terms. I like using the Girardian terms, that it's a mimetic crisis that's moving towards this monstrous doubling par excellence in the church. And that's really what's going on. Uh, in this, that you don't have really opposites that are are, are kind of uh, in conflict with one another. You have you have the same thing. Uh, that's again, you have the the monstrous doubling and then the similarity rather than polarization. And so when we speak about that, these things are dividing our communities in an odd way, they're actually uniting our communities, but they're uniting our communities in a way that is anti-Christian. It's kind of like an antichrist that it's, 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 
it's actually destroying kind of the fabric of the gospel being the center of our communities. And it's replaced it with this constant state of mimetic rivalry. That, that's my insight in terms of the question. As far as what we do about it is, I, I, you know, as, as a priest and evangelist, I have to refocus the community on Christ. There's kind of a, a story about Teresa of Avila going in to reform one of her convents and then placing at the center either an icon or an Internet image of Christ or, or an image of Christ or an image of the Blessed Mother. And, and I think that that's really what the church has to do. Its leadership has to do. It has to kind of move away from focusing on polarization or the mimetic crisis and putting back at the center the image of Christ, particularly that of the crucified Christ. Thank you. Anybody else like to tackle that one? Otherwise, we can move on to another question. We seem to be. I would, I would just add very briefly to that, that um, as someone who's not in the U.S. context and, and has been watching this um, as a, a very interested, you know, observer. I'm. Uh, my PhD was about American studies, and um, I, I'm quite interested in very unique kind of social dynamics of the U.S. That something that maybe you all take for granted, but which is, it, you know, uh, notable to me, is that in the U.S. there seems to be a really tight affiliation between religious identity and political identity in a way that there is not here in Australia where I live or uh, in some of the other countries where I have a, a number of colleagues. And that um, if I were to tell somebody in Australia that I identify as a Christian, they would not be able to extrapolate anything about my political affiliations from that. Which I get the impression, I may be wrong, is would not be the case. Um, in the US, particularly in the, 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 the those who are participating in these very intense social media bubbles where religious identity and political identity have kind of merged into one tribalistic thing. And it's the idea really with these tribes is that they are not defining themselves by who they are for or who they are disciples of, as Father Steve said, you know, that the focus is Christ and Christ crucified, but they are defining themselves based on who they are not and what they are against. Um, exactly. Which is exactly. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. is exactly right. And Carly, you named the demon that, <laughs> <laughs> that, we're, that it's it, the mimetic, the, the fruit of the medic crisis is we, we don't know who we're for or yes. we're, or we're for the wrong Messiah or the wrong Absolutely. God. Yeah. And, and, and that's, that's kind of what the mimetic crisis, the monstrous doubling has created. Uh, mm. That's, mm. that's, that's a phenomenal insight. Thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is, this phenomenon itself is, is quite nascent in Australia. We see very small pockets of it, but um, I hope that we can learn from uh, the ways that you all, begin to help to steer the ships of your church communities that um, those of us who, who begin to encounter this phenomenon can avoid some of this, this tribalism, which has, you know, I mean, really it's such a destructive force amongst a community that should be characterized by enormous self-giving and, 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 and unity despite any number of differences. Well, speaking for myself, I think it's, my political opinions are the least interesting thing about me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny that it's become such a locus of identity. Um, mm. And Renee talks about, you know, when two people want the same thing, people want power and they don't observe that enough about themselves. They want power and influence over each other. Mm. Um, anybody else like to take a crack or shall we move on to another question? Okay. Um, this one's from... Brian Damarich, how ought a Girardian act in our present moment after a year of massive social isolation and a time in a time where we may seem to be re-emerging from the pandemic? 
Do you have any concerns about the tribes we've created in isolation? Well, it's related, isn't it? <laughs> Tribalism. Mm. But still, we've had a year of COVID. Um, and, and so there's, there's something to you know, reflect on in that. So would any of you like to tackle that question? Sure, Brian. Uh, hi, Brian. Um, good to good to be with you. <clears throat> um, Brian is a, a friend of mine, a former student of mine. <clears throat> um, I'm very honored that he showed up for this after having to listen to me for a whole semester. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think obviously, you know, so someone said to me the other night, social media or the the pandemic just sort of took who we are and made us worse. You know, if we're, we're impatient, we're more impatient. If we're, if we're uh, prone to be lo loners, we're even more that. If we're really into being social, we've just found different ways to do that. But I, I do think um, it's, uh, you know, we are, we're not just meant for ourselves, we're meant for each other. And, uh, and that, um, that that's been something that's been missing and our, you know, uh, for, for myself as a Catholic, you know, my faith is in, incarnated in all kinds of different ways. Um, and, uh, you know, the senses are involved. We, you know, we, 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 we do these physical activities. We cross ourselves with holy water. We used to cross ourselves with holy water. And those, those are all important things in that, uh, you know, people need um, physical touch, hugs, safe, uh, safe things, of course, safety is important, but we, we need this. And I think, um, yeah, and I think a lot of people want to want to get back to something. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever go back to things exactly how they were. But um, yeah, I, I do hope that also just the tendency to escalate on social media when it's just a, um, a chat, you know, or it's an abstract person, it does, those things happen, I think, with less frequency when you're standing in front of someone. So I, I would hope it would lead to it, you know, an increase of, of love and charity and patience and all the things St. Paul talks about. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, Cynthia, I think that, you know, we went through a period of time where out of charity, there was a kind of a withdrawal of the church into itself. And, and that was motivated by charity. It was, it was if, we can, if we can protect the vulnerable uh, from, uh, from disease, we, sh we should be willing to kind of make these sacrifices in this moment. But we can't stay in that space because as I said in my remarks, the church becomes sclerotic if it just stays in on itself, it turns in on itself. And so the, at the first moment, the church has to go out and it has to go out to fulfill its mission and it gains strength from that mission. But also <laughs> the reality of Christianity and particularly Christian witnesses, it's never about safety. It's always about risk. And it's that going out that necessitates risk that, that we have to do now as a, as a church. Um, relating that to Girard, the, the message of Girard is needed by the culture, and it's a cultural contrary, which means it's going to tell the culture a truth that it doesn't really want to hear, because if the culture is benefiting from the structures of mimesis that have now been embedded very powerfully in technology. And if yes. what, what Girard is, it can do, what Girard's thought can do, is it can upset that. And <laughs> like the gospel itself, it upsets kind of the institutions of, of power in, 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 in a society. Um, but Girard's, Girard's thought has the potential to upset what our understanding of human interaction on social media has been. There's risk there, but it's a necessary risk to take. So just as the church has to go out and take risks, I think us Girardians, you know, the bearers of Girard's legacy, we're going to have to take some big risks in the years to come to interject the truth of what he said into a very, very powerful culture, which is the culture of technology and, art and artificial intelligence. 
we've got, I think, a question about that somewhere. So I'll look that one up. But meanwhile, here's another one, unless somebody has something to add. Um, this is from Ryan Duns. Many of us here will already be sympathetic to Gerard. It might be helpful for our panelists to identify the growth edges in Gerard's thought. Who are the critics who need to be engaged? Where does mimetic theory need to be developed further? What are the next steps the next generation might take? That would have been a nice concluding sentence and we're not nearly done. <laughs> so we'll make it a middle question. Anyone? Brent, you're nodding sagely. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I think positive mimesis is something that people have been talking about for a while. I think, you know, Gerard uh, said many positive things about mimesis, but so many people, when they hear the theory and then it goes into scapegoat mechanism, it's just, you're saying humans are bad or something uh, like that, that you hear that a lot. And so I think um, positive mimesis and Rene himself used the example of, you know, if I raise my fist to you, then you respond that way. If I put out my hand, you, resp you respond that way and vice versa. If you put out your hand to me, then I will. So what are the ways in which I, I think uh, in terms of growth, I, I think a lot of it is just kind of recognizing ways in which we can think about when escalation is going downhill, making things worse, what are the kind of mechanisms we can use to break it? Like Jesus, you know, um, uh, asking that question, he was without sin, uh, throw the first stone. Um, those kinds of th things. Uh, comedy, I think, helps a lot. Nothing is more mimetic than laughter. Um, I think uh, the, the um, yeah, uh, more studies of comedy perhaps would, would be helpful. Um, Others may have ideas. I'll stop there. Anyone else? I don't know the, if this insight is answering the question, but I, I think the challenge right now is in terms of the, 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 that social media is such a important form of communication. We have to try to make Gerard memeable. <laughs> so that we can have these kind of elevated conversations, but how is it going to then percolate or then filter into the culture unless we're able to kind of take his theories and, and, and bite-size them? And, and, I, and I don't want to do that in a way that does damage to them, but they have to become digestible and uh, be presented in a, in a digestible form in social media. So I think that the next step in this is how do we make Gerard's thought memeable? And I don't have I don't have an answer to that. I, I don't, but I, 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 I do have an I, intuition that it's necessary. I have an idea for that, but I'll <laughs> save it for later. Okay. Um, this is one close to my heart. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, we need to put the image of Christ back at the center of the church, says Father Steve. Do art and literature and music have a role to play in furthering this iconic turn in the Catholic context? Could a recovery of the Catholic aesthetic sensibility within the church be a step towards de-escalating tribalism? As long as it's not giving us something else to argue about. I, I mean, that kind of is, is a, no, because it's, it's the beautiful is one of the transcendentals and it's a route of access to God. So the church through, throughout its history has been producing the beautiful in, in various cultural, artistic, literary forms. It, it's been producing beautiful ways of life, beautiful gestures, things like that, things that can be seen and, and savored and appreciated. So uh, a, a kind of a, a reinvigoration of the church's artistic tradition is necessary because if, if we kind of fall into a, an iconoclasm of the beautiful or become too word oriented, um, the story's not told well. Um, the incarnation is this, is this fleshy embodied encounter and, and that encounter can instantiate itself again and again in space and time through the transcendental of the beautiful breaking in. And how does that happen? It happens in art. It happens in literature. It happens in great stories. So, so yes to what the, the questioner is saying. It's, it's kind of a converting without converting. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. um, 
my friend Dana Joyous says that he thinks, I'm paraphrasing, Leonardo and Michelangelo probably converted more people than all the papal encyclicals. <laughs> and they continue to do so. And they continue to do so. <laughs> Anyone else? The uh, Grant, um, Carly? Just, just to agree, really, that, you know, we have to meet people where they are. And human beings, I, I can't tell you now who said it, but there was this, uh, someone talked about, rather than saying, uh, you know, that, that, that we are kind of homo sapiens, that we are homo narrative. In other words, it's stories that is makes us who we are and that, that is how we grasp truth. And it's through story that we have the transcendental break in. And so, uh, you know, it, it sort of comes, a, you know, being memeable is a part of that really, you know, a, a meme is just kind of a, a, a short, sharp, easily graspable narrative. Um, you know, my little, like the guys there, it's just kind mm -hmm. of, that's it, that's what you get. Um, and so for me, my, my vision for my work over the next couple of years is to create more of these kinds of materials that are about narrative and about art, broadly interpreted as these not very good stick figures that I draw, but uh, that call to something in the human soul and that quite often can move us and indeed convert us. Um, and that as much as I enjoy being an academic and I think there's always room in the church for very rigor rigorous intellectual engagement with theology, when we're talking about evangelism, stories are, are how we are brought into new truths. Stories are also how we are brought, brought into mistruths. Propaganda is storytelling, you know, mm -hmm. um, stuff that happens in the social media bubble that convinces people of highly uh, irrational or uh, untrue things. There's, it's storytelling. It, there's a narrative structure to it. We have so many good questions still, and I'm, we're winding to a, a close, I guess. We could go on a little bit longer because we started late. Um, here's a practical question from Luciano Umerez. Oftentimes there is a huge gap between the rich conversation in academia and the parish level. In order to go out and fulfill our mission at the parish level, we need tools and training on the Girardian theory to stop the contagion. We started a small study group in Manhattan. How can we help? What should we do? I feel we need great Girardians leading the way and a mass popular spread of it. There's uh, James Allison's um, The F Forgiving Victim video series. It's also a book and it's meant specifically for RCIA or basic parish catechism. Um, that would be one place to start. Yeah, um, uh, something we commonly do here is combine uh, James's Forgiving Victim series with my little Gerard book, both of which are intended for a general audience. I actually wrote that book with my mum in mind um, because I was really enjoying being in academia, but I wanted to share what I was learning and thinking about with the people that I love. And so, you know, we need to have materials absolutely to, um, to be able to share in these kind of grassroots groups at the parish level. Ah, it looks like we have Michael Schlisch Chevalier back. He, he disappeared for a while. Um, Michael, would you like to ask a final question? Um, um, it, it seems somewhat unfair for me here to ask a final question, um, but I think I just pose to maybe each of the panelists, um, starting with you, Father Steve, it's easy to look at social media and and to to especially from a Girardian lens and to have some despair. And so I was wondering if I could just invite each of you um, to to just share with our audience something we might hope for, both out of this conversation, but also out of the work that you're doing with Gerard and within each of your uh, vocations as professors, um, as administrators, and as evangelists. 
Uh, I, I'm going to cite as my example, really Bishop Barron himself. And I'm not doing that to kind of puff him up, but I, I'm, I'm saying that there's an intentionality in his approach to social media, which is to instantiate a form of positive mimesis. So what we've been trying to do on social media is model uh, what Christian witness and discipleship should look like in the social media space. That's what he's doing. And, and I mean, that's the kind of hidden Girardian move to his approach. So if, because it, it's the approach we're on fire has been taking for a number of years in all of our, the things that we have produced has been one of positive mimesis. Imitate this, imitate this, Imit, in, in terms of Bishop Barron, imitate his approach, Im, imitate his cultural engagement, things like that. So, you know, in, in a sense, that's what we're doing. It's, it's our approach to social media itself is itself an example of positive mimesis. Carly? Uh, hard to sum up. Um, hope for me generally and my hope for our societies is that this practice of the imitation of Christ does lead us towards the dissolving of the monstrous doubles and the dissolving of the groups that define themselves by who they are not and who they are against. And this doesn't mean that there are no real victims. And I'm wishing now I could have gone into this a little bit because I saw a few of the questions in the Q&A, which are really sort of saying, well, if, if it, you know, if every time we see a mob stoning somebody, that's scapegoating and that that victim doesn't deserve to be scapegoated, then uh, what about if someone commits a monstrous crime and they really have done it? You know, how do we deal with that and, and justice? And I think these are really important questions for us to now be looking at because, of course, people do commit crimes that uh, we cannot simply hand wave away. And, in fact, part of what we're doing as a society is moving towards recognising genuine victims who uh, deserve to be heard and rehabilitated. Um, and then this all connects together for me with this idea of atonement. What atonement is and what redemption is. And I hope very much to be able to announce to you in another 12 months that I have produced another book in the same uh, very informal style about atonement for mostly a Christian audience who are looking for a way to understand Christianity, which doesn't necessitate a violent God. Grant, to close this out. Yeah, I think there's, um, you know, tr tremendous hope. Um, <clears throat> I hope Carly gets that book done and I can't wait for, for Cynthia's uh, new, new book as well. Um, <clears throat> and um, I, I mean, my hopes are that, uh, you know, people, um, come to see Gerard not just as a kind of social theory to examine things, but a way to understand conversion that um, makes sense of the terminology and the vocabulary that people who are raised in religious households are familiar with, but that somehow has kind of lost its flavor. Um, and so I think, Gerard can almost be like a sprinkling of salt uh, in a certain way. And, uh, and that, you know, um, ultimately, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love for big, big sort of social uh, movements to, to, um, to, to sort of sweep over us. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's just a, a kind of, I think a slower process of, of people's hearts being lit on fire and the, the graces that are offered to us and the gifts of Holy Spirit of the Holy Spirit that are promised us are, are manifested in ways that the people can see. Um, so I, I hope uh, Christians um, can can help move uh, social media in the present moment in a more reconciliatory fashion. 
And Cynthia, I know that um, you're moderating this conversation, but you're also so, so intimate with the work of Gerard. So maybe uh, where do you see sort of hope in this as a final response to this question? Oh my goodness. I just think from one book to the next, I want to figure, figure the Penguin Anthology. That's my contribution. I'm a writer, I'm an editor, and we move forward. I guess I don't think about it much because I'm, I'm working. I keep working. <laughs> <laughs> and the hope comes from that. Well, Cynthia, we're grateful to. The we're world grateful. Means something. <laughs> <laughs> we're grateful to you for that work and for the work of helping to moderate this conversation tonight. And I, and on behalf of Cynthia and uh, Lumen Christie and our whole audience. I wanna thank uh, each of you, our panelists for contributing um, from your scholarship and from your experience. And I wanna thank you for the work that you're doing out there, um, especially in this time where, as, as Father Steve has mentioned, you know, it's not just polarization anymore, um, but this monstrous doubling, right? That, 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 that we get caught in these own cycles of mimesis. And so thank you for your work that you're doing both in scholarship and in practice to, to um, help us lead towards greater positive mimesis. Um, and I wanna thank our, our co-sponsors tonight, uh, America Media and Word on Fire, and especially Father Steve for helping to facilitate that relationship with Word on Fire tonight. Um, and I wanna thank you, our audience for joining. Um, and I would invite you to check out our website, lumenchristi.org to find out about more upcoming webinars. Uh, we have our final installation of our series on Hispanic theology um, closing this Tuesday, and at the end of month, at the end of the month in June, our our Catholic Criminal Justice Reform Network programming will reconvene for a focus on race and the criminal justice system. Um, so please uh, tune in. Uh, the The best way is to just sign up for our mailing list. You'll find links for that in the chat. And if you enjoyed tonight's program and uh, you want to help us to make programs like these available for free to viewers like you. We invite you to support us today at www.lumenchristi.org slash donate. Otherwise, once more, I want to join, I want you, our audience, to join me in thanking our panel for a rich conversation. You'll get a link tomorrow in your email so that you can revisit this conversation and you can share it with others. Um, otherwise, have a wonderful weekend, a wonderful three-day weekend, and we look forward to jo you joining us here again soon. Thank you once more to our panelists and take care. And God bless.